In spring, the calm inland waters of the British Isles are the perfect setting for a spectacular display. The performers are a pair of great crested grebe. They come here to raise a family during the warm summer months. The ritualized movements are part of their courtship ceremony. Out on the open water, they perform their elaborate and graceful water ballet. At the height of the display, they quite literally dance on the still water. The Latin name for the great crested grebe is Podiceps cristatus, which means rump-footed and crested. The crest, which divides into two ear tufts, and the glorious chestnut and black frills or tippets are used to express mood or intention. They'll play an important role when the time comes to display and dance. Rump foot arises from the positioning of the legs well back on the body, an adaptation for an almost totally aquatic lifestyle. Grebes don't have webbed feet, like geese and ducks. Instead, each toe is fringed with stiff, horny lobes, and their claws are flattened like toenails. Like all water birds, they spend a great deal of time preening. Oil, collected from the preen gland at the base of the tail tuft, is used to waterproof the plumage. Just over a century ago, their beautiful feathers almost brought about their downfall. Surprisingly, it wasn't the flame-red tippets which were in demand, but the white satin-like feathers on the belly. Sewn together, grebe skins, or furs as they were commonly called, made soft, silky muffs. Their feathers were also used to make matching stoles and collars. Many thousands of grebe were killed to satisfy the whim of the fashionable female, until there were only 32 pairs left in the whole country. In 1880, an act of parliament put a stop to this wholesale slaughter, and from that moment on, the great crested grebe has never looked back. At the last count, there were over 7,000 breeding pairs. Its remarkable comeback is almost certainly due to the large number of man-made waters, which sprung up all over the country after the Second World War. Gravel, clay and sand pits, which provided building materials for the housing boom, and reservoirs, which supplied drinking water for the new communities, were rapidly colonized by grebes. Today, they are found throughout lowland Britain. They prefer stretches with open water and a good growth of reed, but otherwise they're remarkably adaptable. They even breed right in the heart of London. A remote loch in the highlands of Scotland is home to one of three other species of grebe which breed in Britain. The Slavonian grebe is one of our rarest birds. It's easily recognizable by its conspicuous golden ear tufts. Rarer still is the closely related black-necked grebe, there are only 15 breeding pairs. The smallest member of the grebe family is widespread throughout the country. It's the dabchick, or little grebe. Like the great crested grebe, it breeds on ponds, lakes, and slow-moving rivers. It's a dapper little bird with a distinctive rounded shape and bright chestnut cheeks in the summer. Unlike the other grebes, the dabchick does not take to a marine habitat during the winter months. Only when the inland waters are free from ice do the first great crested grebe fly in from the coast.
As soon as they arrive at their summer haunts, each pair stakes out a territory of about five acres, which they jealously guard from all intruders. Coots are bold, bumptious birds, and as we shall see later, can be a serious threat to grebes. Throughout the breeding season, vigorous border clashes occur between the two species. Single, unpaired birds are also unwelcome. These are often newly matured two-year-olds looking for their first sight and mate. A series of loud vocal warnings are usually enough to intimidate a young bird. Occasionally, though, the intruder persists and a fight ensues. Even the coot can't influence the final outcome, and the young bird retreats to try his luck elsewhere. Once their territorial disputes have been settled, the birds concentrate on courtship. The grebe ballet follows a strict routine. Turning to face each other, the dance begins with some head shaking. This is the most common display and is repeated throughout the performance. After a while, they symbolically preen the feathers on their backs. During the early stages, they perform a special greeting ceremony called a discovery display. One bird dives. Its partner waits for it, adopting the bizarre cat attitude. Stranger still is the ghostly reappearance of the first bird. Throughout their courtship, this ritual is repeated each time the birds are parted. Sometimes a discovery is followed by a retreat display. Suddenly one bird patters across the water and adopts the cat attitude. The climax to the performance and the most complicated ritual of all is the weed or penguin dance. Adopting an upright posture, first one bird, then the other, glides below the surface in a slow but deliberate dive. They emerge with a mouthful of weed, sail towards each other and finally rise to dance on the water. Even the best performer gets caught out on occasion.
The Grebe Ballet is over, but the ritual which leads up to mating is also quite a performance. Their first task is to build a special floating platform. The male brings in most of the building material, while his mate arranges it into an untidy pile. When the female is satisfied with the construction, she indicates her readiness to mate with a rearing display. After mating, in true Grebe fashion, they celebrate with a final bout of head shaking. Utterly frustrated, the young unpaired males flirt with some most unlikely partners. By the middle of April, the breeding season is well underway. Great crested grebes build large floating nests which rise and fall with the water level throughout the summer and so avoid being flooded. And they're usually a few feet from the bank, where they're out of reach of land predators like foxes, weasels and stoats. Each female lays one egg a day until she has completed a clutch of between three and six eggs. There are five in this nest. The task of incubation is shared equally by both the male and female, and they change over every 20 minutes or so. The female greets her mate with a wing-quivering display. It's extremely difficult to tell the sexes apart, but the female is usually the smaller bird with a shorter bill. Occasionally, the birds go off together on a fishing trip. Before leaving, the female carefully covers the eggs with weeds. This serves to keep the eggs out of sight from marauding crows and magpies, as well as to insulate them from the cold air. The newly laid eggs are conspicuous, and a clutch left uncovered soon draws attention. It's usually only young, inexperienced birds which leave their nests open to attack. First on the scene is the innocent-looking coot, but it's an opportunist, and with a family of its own to raise, a grebe's egg represents a nourishing meal. The carrion crow is a notorious egg thief. It'll remove the eggs one by one and eat them later at its leisure and at a safe distance. More experienced grebes are wise to the habits of their neighbors, and this coot receives a frosty reception. The coot is only searching for nesting material, but it's far too close to the grebe for comfort. The cat display is a clear sign of aggression. For now, the danger has passed, but the grebe's eggs are soon to hatch, and a worse enemy lurks unseen close at hand. It's mid-May. After a month of patient incubation, the first grebe chicks have hatched. As soon as they're out of the egg, the striped youngsters climb up under their parents' wings. Unlike newly hatched ducklings, which can swim and feed themselves from birth, grebe chicks are totally dependent on their parents for food, warmth and protection. Their first meal is an odd one. It's a feather. The adults will deliberately pluck down feathers from their own plumage to feed their chicks. It's a strange habit, but grebes feed almost exclusively on fish. The feathers form a thick ball of felt in the bird's stomach, which protects them from the needle-sharp bones of their prey. That bright red spot on the chick's head is thought to stimulate the adults to feed them. The greatest threat to a young grebe lurks underwater. The pike is a fierce predator 
and helpless chicks make easy prey. Grebe chicks are not the water babies one might expect. Their soft down feathers become soggy after a few minutes in water, and then they become sitting targets for hungry predators. The chick's thrashing attempts to climb aboard attracts the attention of the pike. But its shrill calls alert an adult to the danger. Then the hunter becomes the hunted. This chick escaped with its life. Others are not so lucky. There's no doubt that large numbers of young grebe end up in the stomachs of pike. While one parent continues to sit tight on the remaining eggs, the other is kept busy providing food for the newly hatched family. The chicks are fed on a diet of fish, supplemented with the odd insect and worm. Sometimes the adults bring in fish which the chicks have no hope of swallowing. Getting the size right appears to be a matter of trial and error. When the last chick has emerged, the adults take their brood out onto the water. Of the five eggs, only three have hatched. The other two were probably infertile. At first, great crested grebes are careful to keep their chicks safely tucked up under their wings. If danger threatens, they'll dive with their young rather than leave them on the surface. This protects them from perch, zander and pike while they're still small. But after a few days, they're already more adventurous. Now the adults unceremoniously dump them on the water for swimming lessons. Their feathers are now waterproof, and they're encouraged to spend less time riding around on their parents' backs. They've developed into highly demanding youngsters with healthy appetites. Providing them with enough food is a full-time job for both parents. This time it's a grebe raiding a coot's nest, but only for building material for its second brood. When the chicks are about five weeks old, the family often divides, each parent taking sole charge of part of the brood. And in four weeks, the adults will leave them to fend for themselves. With the onset of winter, our inland waters begin to ice over. The majority of great crested grebes have deserted the quarries and gravel pits where they've spent the summer to gather on larger reservoirs and lakes where there are still some stretches of open water. Young birds are often reluctant to leave the security of their summer home. As long as there's a hole in the ice, they'll stay to hunt for food. Life underwater is second nature to a grebe. And, as this remarkable film shows, they are highly adept at catching fish. Only prickly sticklebacks or very large fish are brought to the surface. Mainly, they swallow their prey head first, whole and underwater. As the weather gets colder, the longer they linger, the greater the hazards. This one has left it too late. With one leg firmly frozen in the ice, there's no escape. Dancing on still water is one thing. Skating on thin ice is quite another.
As the days get shorter, our grebe leave the inland waters and fly out to sea. Ahead lies a winter of fishing in the coastal waters and estuaries of Britain. The great crested grebe has made a remarkable comeback, but already a new threat looms on the horizon. Water sports are becoming increasingly popular, driving grebes from their breeding grounds. Separate space must be provided for both recreational purposes and wildlife. We must ensure that great crested grebes dance on our still waters for years to come. <laughs>